You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week, we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skibitsky. This week, we welcome autism advocate and author Sam Farmar back to the podcast for another appearance to talk to us about his latest published article, An Autistic's Vision for Neurodiversity Affirming Therapy. This topic is important because it provides invaluable insights from lived experience, fostering inclusivity, and offering practical strategies to enhance therapeutic practices for neurodivergent individuals. Sam, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much, Jeff. Great to be back here with you. Well, it's been a little bit of time, and during yes. that time is that you've published a new article through Autism Spectrum News, and I'd love to hear a little bit about just the synopsis of this article, because I have a feeling this is part of what we're going to be talking about today. All right, Jeff. So basically, um, I'm part of an online community in LinkedIn, uh, mostly on LinkedIn, that includes just a multitude of, of neurodivergent individuals sharing their lived experiences, many of those experiences having been clinical. And a word that, regrettably, I often come across is trauma. Trauma that results from um, adverse behavioral therapy lived experiences uh, that don't take into sufficient consideration neurodivergence. Uh, with autistic individuals, sensitivities run very deep. Many of those sensitivities are sensory in nature, um, which can render us vulnerable uh, to to um, to emotional unease, to emotional meltdowns, to trauma. Trauma is a very strong word. And in learning about the lived experiences of those in my community, the neurodiversity community, for which I proudly advocate, that affects me deeply. And I hear those lived experiences and I validate them and at the same time, I consider my own clinical experiences as a late identified autistic. And I take into account all that I've learned uh, in working with clinicians, uh, many of whom are at Florio, um, which I know you're familiar with by virtue of your relationship with VJ. Um, from whom I've learned a great deal from clinicians. And so this article is a synthesis, really, of all that I've learned from clinicians, from other neurodivergent individuals, and considering my own clinical experiences. Well, I'd, I'd love to tackle the idea of trauma and, and maybe do this in a couple different tranches. The first one that I'd love to speak about is, is what I would consider almost the most egregious when we're talking about physical trauma, things that, that we are doing as a community that are causing some physical impact to uh, the autistics um, and the individuals that are that are experiencing this particular event. Um, one of them you're, you're personally advocating right now, the removal of, which to be honest, and I'm, I'm going to say is that up until three years ago, I thought that this particular practice was gone and it was electra shock and as a judge Rotenberg Center. But um, there are other ways that physical trauma is done. It's mechanical restraints. It's using aversive sprays. It's uh, things yes. like that. So give me a little bit of a background about the trauma that you're seeing on the physical side of treatment right now that maybe some of us thought was not really relevant because we thought it was gone. <laughs> so the Judge Rotenberg Center is located only two towns over from me in Massachusetts. And I wasn't even aware of what was going on there 
until the authors of a book called Pain and Shock in America sent me their book, asked me to read it and to write about it and to talk about it, that I had no idea until I had read this book. Or you're right, Jeff. It's a whole range of aversive interventions, the worst of which would be considered to be electric shock, quote unquote treatments, which you have to put in quotes because it's more like torture than treatment. But up to this day and prior to the use of electric shock, you're right, there would be other aversives involved in their methods, including ammonium spray in your face, uh, the denial of meals, um, other types of uh, interventions that cause physical pain. Um, when you are given food, you might have uh, you might have very small samples of food that might, for example, have a, a very strong seasoning or, or something added to it to really make it taste putrid. I mean, those kinds of very severe, uh, inhumane, arguably torturous interventions. So it's a whole broad range of aversives not just electric shock, but um, there's a bill before the Massachusetts State House, the Massachusetts State Legislature called House Bill H-180 here in Massachusetts, which seeks to outlaw and ban these aversive practices across the state, not just at the JRC, but but across the state. Um, and I went to the public hearing, I testified. This is something I'm in the middle of writing about that'll soon be published. It was my experience at the hearing. And uh, when you think of neurodiversity affirming therapy, you think of that as the, as the extreme opposite. Of, of what this is. It's, um, it's punishment and it's torture that can't possibly be doing right by, by the person being targeted. We all like to think of ourselves, I think, I would hope, as being in the business of helping other people. Uh, aversive interventions and punishment do not help. That's not a way to help a person move forward. It's important to exercise compassion, kindness, acceptance, understanding, all of which, in my view, are integral to this notion of neurodiversity affirming therapy, where if you're going to be neuroaffirming, uh, in my view, there really can't be any punishment, any aversive interventions of any kind involved, because that's where trauma happens. That's where PTSD can occur. That's where people can really develop challenges around anger around anxiety, depression, not to mention physical pain. In the case of electric shock, burn marks on your skin. Where do you draw the line? No, and that's all of that is extremely scary to even think about, Sam. It's, uh, I mean, would, would the practice be occurring if it wasn't a neurodivergent individual that had a way to be able to empower their voice in a way that maybe the neurodivergent doesn't feel they have right now. And maybe that's another issue is that how do we empower the voice of those? Self-advocacy, absolutely. Absolutely um, critical. Self-advocacy. 
And I think and I think the community has to give a platform for that. And as much as we put the onus on the individual and on the self is that we as a community have to support hearing perspectives, hearing voices and being able to kind of make sure it's there. Just a curiosity, you've been at um, some of these um, hearings. The I'd be curious to hear what is the justification. Is it that the behavior that itself is so dangerous and they feel like they need to use a, the, this aversive sort of treatment where I think the science of even in the behavioral field, we've improved so much to be able to find a sense care that fits the same model. And that's the thing, Jeff. Um, for a while now, the claim has been is that electric shock treatments, when regulated, and that's an issue because government regulations often fall short of their goals, um, that they could reverse behaviors that can get pretty extreme, that can result in self-injury, that can pose a danger to others, but like you just said, there are for a couple of years now, at least a couple of years, proven, alternative, more humane, more compassionate interventions that get results. Uh, because we agree, I think, that injurious and self-injurious behaviors need to be addressed. The question becomes, how do you address it? It ought to be addressed in a humane, compassionate way. And testimony at the public hearing for House Bill H-180 touched on that, on alternative, more individualized, to your point earlier about the dangers of generalization, of taking a blanket approach, these are individualized interventions that get results without the pain, without the trauma, without the emotional and psychological scars, mm -hmm. uh, which you need to have if you're going to do neurodiversity affirming therapy. No punishment or aversive interventions of any kind exercising kindness and empathy, being able to put yourself as a clinician in your client's shoes and say, would I want to be treated this way? No, I would want to be treated this way. Yeah. Um, and in a way that is client-centric, taking into account the wants and needs, the sensitivities, the unique attributes, um, the passions, the interests of the client to make therapy more client-centric to help them rather than to traumatize them or to erode self-esteem, sense of self, to be accepting rather than punishing. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, as as you go through and describe that entire process, I, I think that that's just that's good practice. That's good clinical practice is being able to really understand all the strengths and being able to figure out what's important, the priorities, how to empower, how to look at all these pieces and include the recipient of care into the decision making model. Um, which can be hard at times. This neurodiversity is this huge spectrum. I mean, it's, it's that a is whole the variety. challenge at hand. Our community is anything but monolithic, mm -hmm. and that is where it's important, in my view, for the clinician to do his or her research and to ask questions. Um, the Socratic pursuit of truth. If you want to gain knowledge, ask the right questions to arrive at that knowledge of before the skill building or therapeutic process begins, before it even begins, 
get a strong sense, if not from the client, then from a parent of the client, a trusted friend or relative of the client, of what are the client's sensitivities. Based on the client's lived experiences, what are the triggers to watch out for, to avoid? Mm -hmm. Triggers for, for uh, sensory overload, for emotional unease, for meltdowns, for trauma. Yeah. What are the client's passions? For example, if you have a passion for video games, or if you have a passion for music, have in the clinic a TV with a video game console connected to it. And if the client during a session were to need a break, maybe something that happens in the session that is stress-inducing warrants cutting that off, taking a break, go into the other room and take a few minutes and play a video game. Or I have an electronic keyboard plugged into the other room, go and play piano. Mm -hmm. Or if or if you have a, a musician, neurodivergent, who plays violin or flute or what have you, I mean, those are more portable instruments, bring your instrument to the therapy session. If you need a break, if it'll put you at ease, if it'll make you feel good, play a little, take a few yeah. minutes. Taking into account the talents, the passions, the interests of the client, for example, just to name a few examples. Yeah, and I think you're, I think that you're hitting on something that I find extremely important. It's not just on the regulation component of, you know, what's going to be soothing for an individual, but it's also on what is important for this particular individual and in the way that they can be a part of the community, the way that they can express themselves, the way that they can involve themselves in the world around them, is that sometimes we restrict that for um, neurodivergent people by saying, you know, this is what I'm going to allow you to do. Versus saying and that this is, is what you care problematic, about. and that and that lead that can lead to great harm, mm -hmm. because if you treat somebody as if they are broken and they need to be fixed, there's so much negative fallout from that. It's the impact on self-esteem of receiving the message that I'm broken, and I need to be fixed or I need to be cured. Um, autistics, including me, are perfectly open to skill building. I'm grateful for the clinical experiences I've had that helped me build skills that I wanted to build upon, that I wanted to improve. Therapy on my terms, what I wanted to get better at. The question is, how? Are we helping for, for those skills to be developed? How is it being done? Um, what I love about Florio is that you have a wide, wide variety of lessons that develop any number of different types of skills that are done at various different levels that allow for a given learner to be able to start out at a level at which he or she is comfortable with and then maybe build beyond that or maybe not, where there are allowances during a Florio lesson to take breaks when they're needed. Uh, and all of those are such important, those are, those are important components to treatment. I mean, it's trying to figure out the pacing for myself individually. What's going to be best? 
how can I use the information that I'm being taught? How do I use this communication skill in a way that's empowering me individually to get my message across? One how set of I lessons in, in the Florio Library, of which I am very fond, is um, this series of, of lessons around cafeteria, school cafeteria social sense. It starts out with the learner getting a sense of entering the cafeteria and first figuring out where he's going to sit, followed by actually sitting down at the table, followed by participating in conversation at the table, and then initiating conversation at the table. And then when somebody else comes to the table, finally, to take the initiative to introduce that individual to others already at the table, a progression mm -hmm. where uh, whatever works for the client, the whole gamut, the possibilities are there of where do you start so that you're meeting the client where he or she is at? And then what can you progress to little by little? Because if you demand too much, if you expect too much, if you, as a clinician, were to impose your wants and needs on the client, that's where overwhelm and all the fallout from that can happen, which is why the first bullet point in my article in Autism Spectrum News is to meet the client where they're at. When you're meeting the client where they're at, Sam, I mean, it's not just on where, what skills are there and, and what strengths are there. How do you effectively communicate either with the client, with those that really understand what the expectations or the feeling of the client are, if the client has a difficulty communicating some of that on their own, how do you how do you understand where those priorities are when you maybe don't have somebody who could self-advocate? Maybe somebody isn't able to express everything that they're wanting out of treatment. So what you do is you ask the right questions. Um, some of us are more visual learners, others of us more auditory. As a visual learner, communication with me might be more effective if it's given to me in writing. Um, I benefit from clear, unambiguous, specific, detailed instructions. Just, just as a for instance, if in my clinical office, I have a corner of the office with multiple toys to play with, uh, the clinician asks, go over there and bring me a toy. Well, if you have a diversity of different kinds of toys, of different types, of different colors, go and bring me a toy is insufficient for, for many neurodivergent individuals. I know I'd get confused. There's so many to choose from. Which one do I choose? That could really stress me out. That could cause emotional unease. Versus, uh, bring me a toy from the corner, and you can pick out whichever one of those toys that you want to pick out. There's specificity in that that makes it safe for me to go over the corner and pick out whatever toy I want and bring it over. Or bring over this specific toy. Or bring me a toy that's of this color or of this type. Just as an example, detailed, specific, unambiguous communication that doesn't put the neurodivergent learner into a position of having to guess, of having to assume, 
of having to infer, of having to read between the lines, because that is often where we struggle and where some of us ultimately drown. <laughs> yeah, no, and I appreciate uh, that feedback, Sam. Because and and wonderful... again, the notion of of um, spoken versus written communication, understanding how the client learns best, whether auditory, visual, or otherwise. And that's where knowledge of the neurotype comes in. In my view, autism is a neurotype. The DSM-5 would have me believe differently. They'd have me believe that as an autistic, that I'm disordered, that I'm, which implies to many of us in the community that we're deemed broken and in need of healing or to be fixed or to be cured where really there's, we're, many of us are fine with who we are. What we have is a unique neurotype. The way our brain is wired, the way our nervous system functions, that we're not deficient, we're not disordered, we're just different. Mm -hmm. We have a neurotype that is in the minority. And the expectations, Jeff, of the greater society, of the non-autistic majority, around socialization, around behavior, around communication, around learning and thinking, can be very, very, very disabling to us. External factors, external expectations of the greater society can be very, very disabling to us. Yeah. Neurodiversity affirming therapy takes that into consideration. And this is where kindness and empathy and understanding come in, where we're allowed to be free, to be who we are. Stimming is a good example. All of us stim. All of us have a need to self-regulate in any given situation. Because we have a different neurotype, autistics often will stim in very different ways than will non-autistic individuals. Unlike most non-autistic individuals, we might stim by, uh, by moving our hands, by, um, by using fidgets, uh, by rocking back and forth. If we don't make eye contact in a way that's a self-regulatory behavior, because in not having to make eye contact, we're better able to listen with our ears and perhaps even more importantly with our hearts than if we have to look somebody in the eyes and then we're dealing potentially with more sensory input from the eye contact than we can handle, interfering in our ability to listen with our ears and with our hearts. And that might even cause sensory overwhelm or mm -hmm. meltdown. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Sam. Extreme family. trauma if when it's you, ongoing. When you had when you had mentioned some of the stems that uh, that maybe an autistic might display Antibody. versus a, a, a somebody who I doesn't think. identify autistic, is is if I sit there and tap my foot constantly, normal. Now yeah, I do that with a different body stimming, part, my hands. You're stimming just in a different way than yeah. me. <laughs> and it's it is funny we how society stand. has looked through these things and, and deemed certain things appropriate and inappropriate. But I think what you're talking about with neurodiversity affirming care, it's really understanding what's best for the individual. If right. their soothing method is this, well, let's figure allow out them a way to, to do incorporate it. it. Yeah. And body language becomes very important. When they're needing to stem, to self-regulate, if they're rocking back and forth, 
if they're flapping their hands, even if they get out of their seat to move around a little bit, whatever they need to do to self-regulate. The key is don't pass judgment on that. And how you communicate in many ways is more important than what you communicate. Don't have that angry or frustrated look on your face when somebody stims in a way that you might find just a little bit awkward, maybe. Um, refrain from saying, stop that, that's wrong. Mm. Don't do that. Be accepting. I think as a Other treatment individuals community. Individuals need to self-regulate, for example. Yeah, I mean, as a treatment community, I think that we've moved in the right direction with saying, you know, treatment shouldn't be compliance-based. It should be ascent based. It should be individualized to understanding yes. what's important for that Meeting individual. Meeting the client where he or she is at. Mm -hmm. That's individualized. Taking an individualized approach based on that individual's wants and needs, sensory sensitivities. Many autistics have, have sensitivities to extreme light or to extreme noise. Mm -hmm. If there can be an area in the clinic that perhaps could be a sensory space or a sensory room where no talking is allowed, where the lights are dim, or ideally in, in the clinician's office, that if you know in advance that the individual you're working with has an extreme sensitivity to light, dim the lights in your office. If it's during the day, you might even turn off the lights. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, any loud noises, try to cultivate in an area of a lower volume mm -hmm. for those with noise sensitivities. Whatever the sensitivity might be, this is where asking the right questions, doing the homework, doing the research, learning from the lived experiences of the individual, of what they enjoy, what they have a challenge with, their sensitivities, et cetera. Um, and with respect to eye contact, if working on eye contact causes undue stress or unease on the client, don't teach it. Mm -hmm. Don't impose it on the neurodivergent individual, because if you do, that might be enough to cause trauma. Again, I run into this word trauma in the neurodiversity community far more often than I should be. Yeah. Uh, and this is where, again, knowledge of the neurotype comes in handy, that with autism, you have any number of sensory sensitivities that are common. Granted, we're not a monolith, but there are certain commonalities that more often than not you're gonna run into, but this is where the individualized approach becomes important. Um, if an individual listens best without making eye contact, don't impose making eye contact skill building on that individual. Work on other skills. Our neurotypes for all of us dictate what we're able and willing to comfortably learn in the way of skills and what we're not comfortable with. What we're not going to get good at, no matter how hard we try, like I'm I'm never going to be, for example, despite my height, I'm never going to be a professional basketball player. It's just not in my neurotype. It's mm -hmm. not in my neurology that I would have the skills to be that kind of a person. It's understanding a person's limits. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a to question for you. What skills to build, what not to build on, mm -hmm. because if you impose a skill that ought nothing should be imposed 
Mm -hmm. But um, care needs to be taken, in other words, in terms of, in my view, what skills are okay to teach and what are not okay. Stay well, away from the ones that aren't okay based on the individual's challenges, unique attributes, et cetera. Well, let's, let's go deeper into that because one of the things is that, I mean, aut aut autism is a journey. I mean, it's obviously is that like any life is that we change our interests, we change our skill sets as time goes on and moves on and we have different priorities for our lives. One of the things that I think creates trauma is that social trauma of marginalizing somebody. And I have a question that kind of goes into, you know, you talk about life skills, you talk about developing uh, a way to be able to, to, to do what you want in the world and not be typecasted. Is that when I see different kind of school policies, things like that, that say, okay, well, I'm, my life skill might be is that everybody in special education is going to clean up the cafeteria every day after lunch. This isn't a life skill that we're teaching neurotypical, non-neurodivergent uh, individuals. We're imposing that this is what this individual needs to do. We've catered to this is the life skill that we're saying is you're cleaning up after others. Does that not create the same sort of trauma as maybe some of the emotional trauma or physical trauma that goes on by saying this is your role, this is your lot in, in our community? I would agree, and this is where accommodations and things like IEPs in schools, I think, become very important. Depending upon the individual, certain exemptions from certain tasks to be done may very well be necessary for that individual's well-being. Um, and this is the challenge with accommodations. Where things can get problematic is that if somebody notices one person getting accommodations, but then another person isn't getting them, then resentment can set in. And that is a challenge that we should try to address, I think, as a society, is this notion of one person may need to be accommodated in certain ways that are different from how another individual may, may need to be accommodated. That if a given task or a, a given expectation does more harm than good, this is where accommodations can become very important in that they allow us to be at our best, not just to be at our best for ourselves, but to better be able to do right by others around us. Accommodations allow us to be at our best for ourselves, for other people. And that, I guess, Jeff, would be my response. Yeah, that's that just scenario. something I've been thinking about is that yeah. sometimes we create these these roles for people and this view of people without taking into account the individual themselves and understanding right. that this, this might not be what they want to do in their life. Exactly. They might want to, you know, uh, they, they might want to be somebody who's working on programming. They might want to be somebody exactly. who is a barista. I mean, who knows what somebody wants to be? It's There's a variety of different options. And out that's there. where and the challenge lies. That's where the challenge lies because individualized um, therapy or teaching or whatever it is, admittedly, there are challenges with that. It's easy for you and I to be talking about these things during a podcast. To actually put them into practice, certainly I can imagine there are challenges there. It's involved, but that doesn't change the fact that it is of, in my view, utmost importance to, uh, to be as individualized in, in how you treat people mm -hmm. uh, just because of the sheer diversity it, not just within the neurodiversity community but across 
really all of society, all of humanity. That, I think, is where the challenge lies. But as advocates, we have to start from somewhere. We need to at least get the dialogue started and to further the dialogue. And with more dialogue, ideally, would come greater change. So with can... artistic individuals, uh, again, we're, we're dealing with societal expectations that were not written with us in mind. Granted that, our need for certain accommodations will no doubt be of greater need than perhaps for non-autistic individuals who might have a whole other set of needs. And as individualized as we can get in how we treat neurodivergent individuals in a clinical setting, at the workplace, for example, in school, in life in general, the better, as, as good as we can do in that effort, because I understand it's an involved effort to take individuality into consideration. It's an involved effort, but it's, it's one that should it's be important. a responsibility yeah. of, of whoever is involved in, in helping to create a care plan or to be involved in representing and empowering the individual who's part of that particular experience. But how can therapists create this safe place for neurodivergent clients to unmask and express their, their true selves or to give that voice to somebody who can, who can represent the neurodivergent who maybe doesn't feel comfortable or safe or empowered to do so on their own? So uh, somebody who hasn't self-advocated before, the vision that I have of that is that, let's say, you're in a clinical session and you notice that your client needs a break from whatever is going on. The, the clinician, in my vision of this, would say, uh, Sam, why don't you take a break? It seems to me that maybe you could use one. Oh, and by the way, it's okay for you to ask for a break whenever you feel you need it. But perhaps initially it might be necessary for the client to hear the clinician say, why don't you take a break? We've been at this for a little while. Your body language suggests to me that what we're working on has, has perhaps uh, been, been uh, a bit much on you that you could use a breather. The more they hear that, in my view, the better that would prepare them to eventually speak on their own, to self-advocate of, I need a break, please give me a break. And in a neurodiversity affirming therapeutic session, the clinician would say, absolutely, okay. Good for you for self-advocating. Take the break when you need to, and then we'll and then we'll come back to it later, or we'll move on to something else. Yeah, it sounds if like somebody you're is with that compassion, that kindness, that compassion empathy, and kindness experience. are core to it. Mm -hmm. It's core to that. So that might be a scenario where self-advocacy skills can maybe begin to be taught in a humane, decent, kind, neuroaffirming fashion. Now, um, if the client is non-speaking, there are assistive technologies that can enable that individual to communicate his or her wants and needs. You have letter boards. You have various technologies. Uh, maybe it's a keyboard or, or an iPad or something. There are apps that I've heard about for, for smart devices that will enable non-speaking individuals to communicate that um, those assistive technologies clearly need to be accepted and, if need be, 
to be a part of the interaction between the clinician and the client in a scenario where the client is non-speaking. For example, even beyond that, you have body language. I'd imagine you have body ways language. that you can look at uh, facial and I mean just responses and correct. If the uh, if the client is stimming more than he or she might typically, that could be a body language cue to the clinician to suggest, okay, maybe it's time for a break. Or maybe this is a skill that is demanding too much. The point I make in my article about realistic expectations, maybe with extra stimming, too much is being expected, that maybe this is a skill that shouldn't be taught and you move on to something else. Because where the danger is, again, is if is if a clinician's agenda is imposed on the client without empathy, without understanding. This is not clinician-centric therapy. The therapy, I would argue, needs to be client-centric mm-hmm. if it's going to be neuro-affirming. No, that sounds that sounds spot Body on. Body language can give all kinds of clues to the clinician of, okay, we need to stop, mm-hmm. or time for a break. We'll come back to this later, or we'll ditch it altogether because it's causing undue stress and emotional unease. That through body language can be conveyed by the neurodivergent client, and that needs to be listened to, that needs to be noticed and taken to heart. Absolutely. Where where can people access some of the resources and some of the articles that, that you've been investing your time and energy in, in creating? So at samfarmerauthor.com, uh, there's a media page with just a ton of content, links to published articles, even to some of our past podcasts, to others' podcasts, videos of author talks, interviews, etc. There's a lot of free content on the media page of my website. And then, of course, I have my book entitled A Long Walk Down a Winding Road. There's information about me, about my book, on samfarmerauthor.com as well. And there's a contact page uh, that people can use to reach out to me if need be, and then some on the website. But those are the key highlights of what's there, samfarmerauthor.com. Well, I appreciate the time that you gave us again, Sam. It's, uh, it's always enlightening. And then also just the willingness that you have to be able to share your experiences I think it's something that I always uh, I, I look at and, and I truly appreciate. So thank you so much for coming on the show again. Hopefully we can get you back again sometime soon. That'd be wonderful, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week. 